We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. struggling to find a name for the podcast audience i know all of them are trash I, I i don't like gators that much some people are like it's the best of the worst yeah but but it really does hearken too much to florida gate obviously yes and, and that's the biggest reason it sucks we had a guy, a guy reached out to me and said gatekeepers which i don't makes hate. it too professional and weird but it's it's gatekeepers like has, they're protecting has something. A, yeah i'll say gatekeepers has like a almost a negative connotation in today's day and age of someone who doesn't want someone to do what they do which we don't need that. And yeah. we're, we're all love here. Anyone that wants to be a Gator can be a Gator if they want. Wow. To. Wow. So we're not was, gatekeeping that was, anything. That was sweet, dude. Thank One you. guy reached out to me. He's like, it might not be PC, but what if you just call us degenerates? I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if that's a great name or not. Um, I think there's opportunity to maybe just go like completely away from like the name and just yeah. call them like the squad, the crew or whatever. And like you're consistently referring to them as this like team. But we need more name suggestions because I'm not going with gatekeepers. And I think we have to move away from Gators at some point before Stone Rochelle, shout out, producer fires out some merch for the show that's the catch and early buzz hasn't we haven't had a lot of time in between here um before we get into anything else the presenting sponsor of the tailgate podcast even the bonus episodes is DraftKings. the moment we've been waiting for since september is finally here in honor of the big game DraftKings sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the super bowl 56 is giving new customers 56 to 1 odds on either team bet just five dollars and get 280 in free bets if your team wins DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in New York, meaning you can bet for almost a third of the country. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, play DraftKings Daily Fantasy Football and Contests for Super Bowl 56. New customers could get a free shot at a $1 million top prize with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF and get 56 to 1 odds on either team. Bet just $5 and get 280 in free bets if your team wins. That's promo code PFF at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 56. 21 years or older, see DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details for a full list of requirements and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Gambling problem called 1-800-GAMBLER. Mike, we have yet to talk about, discuss, or finalize what the hell we're doing for the su Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. We live together now. Okay. We're going back to Cincinnati tomorrow night. Or you're going somewhere in the midday. What the hell are we doing? I say we go to Holy Grail. Holy Grail? Anyone who hasn't been to Cincinnati, Holy Grail is a bar that is directly across from the stadium for the Reds. It it's is also like four, four floors below our new apartment. And it's where we live. Yeah, it's literally <laughs> right below, below where we live. And apparently NBC's cameras are going to be there. Oh. So. So we'll, get we'll be famous. After. We'll be famous. We'll be famous after. Um, all right, let's get into trivia. Stone Rochelle, who's working the booth here, is going to type in the question into the tailgate Slack channel, the infamous tailgate Slack channel, and then it's not infamous at all. It's not infamous, it's but he's going to type way. it there somewhere. Oh, and you just typed in a DM. There you go. Switching it up. This is from Perk Angel. Shout out Perk Angel. He always and brings the heat. Lance Store both asked this. So two guys, oh. Perk Angel, Lance Store. Shout out to Gator Lance and Gator Perk. Joe Burrow was the first overall pick in 2020. Matthew Stafford went first in 2009. This is the second time ever that two number one overall picks, QBs, squared off in the Super Bowl. What was the first? I know what it is, but do you know? I want to say, was Joe Namath the first overall pick? No, it was fairly recent. Oh, okay. Peyton Manning and Cam Newton. Yep. Nice. Easy money. Thanks for that, Stone. Next question from Stone Rochelle. On the hop. <laughs> you knew how this was going to go. <laughs> this is how trivia works. Here we go. If the Bengals win on Sunday, it'll be their first Super Bowl in three tries. What four teams have never made it to a Super Bowl? Detroit Lions. Okay. Have the Houston Texans? I don't think the Houston Texans have. Yeah. Houston Texans, Detroit Lions. Mm. I want to say never been to a Super Bowl. Detroit Lions, Houston Texans. I'm going Jacksonville through. Jaguars. Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, have the Browns? 
Maybe, maybe like a championship back not. in the day. I'm not sure. I'm gonna let's let's submit that final answer. Yeah. Browns, Jaguars, Lions, Texans. Wow, on the money. Let's go. Let's go. All right, so you know the next drill here. Question coming from Stone Rochelle. Shout out. If the Bengals win on Sunday, a lot of Bengals love here. Joe Burrow will become the first QB to ever win the Heisman National Championship and Super Bowl. That's that's pretty fucking sick. Only two other QBs have won a national championship and a Super Bowl. Who oh, wow. are they? Interesting. That's tough. That's going to be deep cuts. That I don't know if I'm going to have this. Well, mm, is it going to be deep cuts? Did Joe Montana win national championship with Notre Dame and Super Bowl? I have no. Oh, he gave us a hint. Both, Both have, have the, the same, same first name. name. How that happen? Joe? Joe Montana, Joe Namath. I like that. Joe Montana, Joe Namath. Wow. Bang. And then it's going to be Joe, too. It's going to be three Joes. Three Joes. Wow. I named right. my, I'm naming my son Joe. No, you're not. <laughs> All right, next one. Joe Renner. Joe Renner's trash. <laughs> That's it, Stone. That's it. There we go. The trivia. Three do you have three, dude. Do you have a know your best, co-host? That's our best trivia. Oh, easily. Ability. Do you have a know uh, your co-host? Anything fun and special? I don't have a good know my co-host now. Do you? Right, fair. No, I don't. I okay, don't. well, that's right. good. Let's move to the mailbag. Shout out to everyone who did the mailbag episode via Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, that's how you submit your written mailbag questions. Leave a review, a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with your question in there, and we will add it to the show. No speak pipes this week. No if you went pipes. to speakpipe.com slash tailgate, left a voicemail on the road, unable to have that technology on the road, we will throw those in to probably a bonus mailbag episode next, next week. week. All right. Before we get into the mailbag, another proud sponsor of the tailgate podcast is Western Southern. While you focus on your roster moves, Western Southern helps advance your money moves, buying your first home, planning to start a family, learning how to make your money grow. Western Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. All righty then. I forgot to mention this at the top. I got Marshall Falk joining the podcast at the back end here. Marshall Falk former San Diego State legend. Mm. I'd be honest, I opened with, I went San Diego State, guy couldn't care less. Mm. Legitimately couldn't care less. He may have been mailing it in. He may have been, but it's a still a great interview. He talks Rams, he talks Bengals. <laughs> there is no banter back and forth. I will say that, I'm just gonna tease it properly, but it's still a phenomenal interview at the back end. Make sure you listen to me and Marshall Falk ripping it up. All right, first mailback question. This is from Mendoz, QM on Apple Podcasts. First impressions of each other. My first impression was that you were kind of, it's not that different than kind of who I always see you now. Kind of like a preppy douche, okay. kind of lazy. Accurate. Not lazy, but like willing to cut corners. Mm -hmm. But. Oh, shit, Barry Sanders. That's kind of, oh, is that Bernie Sanders? Yeah, over there. My bad. Sorry. Bad podcast. <laughs> oh, it is bad. Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Barry Sanders. Did you just say Bernie? Um, no, Bernie Sanders. That sounds, Barry I mean, Sanders. yeah, I don't think you're wrong. That's probably about right. Uh, that's probably the impression I give off right or wrong well it's like you know you like come from like this nice background you kind of like that you kinda, i give off that i come from a nice background you do you do you do yeah, well, you give off you got like this preppy come from money douchey cut corners type but okay. at your at your core you're a good dude all right well that's very nice of you to say <laughs> um i can't even i like i said i didn't even know you were in the office for like six months before yeah. no one did yeah i was I, that's when I didn't go in the office though. Yeah, like, yeah. I didn't have to go work in the. You came in like what, 2017? Yeah, summer, and by then I had already like gotten fired by Neil and gotten my job back. That's right. And so the resolution of that whole story, I don't know if I've told that one on the pod, is that I. I don't think you should. Yeah, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I don't think you should even reference it. Is that I didn't have to go in the office anymore after that, and so I didn't go in the office for yeah. that whole fall, and then all of a sudden I like. Meet, met you like probably right before the holiday party that year mm -hmm. or something and i was like oh this guy's like cool he uh he at least um he at least talks like a no normal human being you Which know like a huge that's a bit like a huge win in the analytics business guys that like talk about stats and like whatever that's not always the case you yeah. know it's not always the case that someone seems like they can actually interact with others so that was probably my first that uh, first summer guy, it was surprisingly uh normal that first summer we hung out was a fucking dream yeah that was that, a good time that was a good summer all right next one this is from davo on spotify not barry sanders who's sitting over there as you openly called out um just right in my line of sight sorry best fits on each team for the joker role on both sides of the ball like debo samuel derwin james etc who's that type in this draft defense is very obvious it's kyle hamilton i mean 
I, I think any position you want him to play on the defense side of the ball, I think he's very capable of doing. Even if you want him to put on 30 pounds and rush the passer, he can do it. So that's that's he's got a unique skill set yeah. to, to, to play a joker role. Offensive side of the ball is a little more difficult. I think he could throw like a guy like Traylon Burks some handoffs and like what he could do with the ball in his hands. But the guy I would highlight is Sky Moore from Western Michigan, one of my faves in the class, who's more of a running back build. He's like 5'9", 200. And so could actually take carries out of the backfield. They're like reminiscent of kind of, you know, when Randall Cobb got used in that by the Packers at times, so he could do that stuff for you. I also even throw in Dontario Drummond from Ole Miss into that mix because he's not, he's more of like Ty Montgomery than that. He's not a real rock wide receiver, in my opinion. Like he's, you're not going to set him out on the outside and expect a lot out of him. But with the ball in his hands, he's still dangerous. So could get some touches. You're distracted by Barry Sanders. I was distracted by notification from Waj. Did you see the big monster tray in the NBA? I know we're not an NBA podcast, but yeah. James Harden is going to the Philadelphia 76ers for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks. Oh, wow. That's a lot. I don't care. You don't Bucks care? Bucks and six. Bucks and six. Shut up. It's a Warriors year. It's a Warriors <laughs> year. Have you seen the Warriors this year? No. Have you? I actually haven't. <laughs> You're I don't watch the NBA. All right. Uh, it's a Warriors and six type of, day, type of year. Todd, this is from Todd is boy. How rare, how rare is the Bengals jump? What team has best the best chance to make a similar jump next year? I mean, it's rare in that, like, in your second season in the NFL as a quarterback, coming after a monster injury with a roster you wouldn't even have called going into this year top 10, yeah. like, uh, holistically, this is, I think, one of one. I don't think we see another jump like this. Like, Trevor Lawrence and the Jags aren't making this jump next year. Zach Wilson well, well, and the Jets aren't making this jump this so year. So, they didn't really make that jump. You know, like, they didn't make a much more drastic of a jump than, say, like, the Colts did with Andrew Luck. They just kind of, kind of got hot and ran the table in the playoffs. Yeah. You know, like, them making the Super Bowl is an oddity. That's a one-of-one one sort of oddity for Joe Burrow to do that in the second season. I mean, they're but, dogs in the last two games, like big dogs. Yes, yeah. So, like, that, in, that, from that perspective, to get all the way to the Super Bowl, but, like, to go from being doormat to good is why we say – you draft quarterbacks to get a franchise quarterback because yeah. that takes you there. Mm -hmm. Like Joe Burrow becoming that guy has taken him there. So so going back, like the Colts with Luck, the Chiefs with Mahomes, shit, even the Eagles with Wentz, like they made that leap, the Panthers with Cam Newton, because they found that franchise guy. And so the teams that I think could make that leap next year, Jets, Jaguars. I'm probably not going to throw the Bears in there because they're actually just, they're kind of a shit cap situation. They can't add talent. But like those teams will have cap space can add free agents, can have put pieces around their quarterbacks to where you could see a massive leap from them in year two. So those are the teams I'd probably highlight. So not necessarily predicting like a red hot Super Bowl run. Yes. That's but predicting like massive leap and improvement yes. to where like you're making the playoffs, right? Yeah. And have a home playoff game in the yeah. first round. I think that's fair. Um, this is from B Wayne 95 on Apple Podcasts. Rank these wide receivers individually with the last few classes. So it, he went on to list a bunch of wide receivers. But I'm just going to rank the last few classes. I think Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle are better prospects last year. Than any receiver than this year. Than any receiver this year. But then I think Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Jameson Williams are better than that next tier of wide receivers. Oh, I would wow. put all those guys ahead of – so the next two on the PFF board were Rashad Bateman and Elijah Moore. So I would go, like I said, Chase Smith, Waddle, London, Wilson, Williams – then Bateman Moore, and then probably Alave Burks behind Bateman and Moore. Okay. So kind of that's how I would tier those. And, and Alave and Burks pretty close to the Bateman and Moore tier. I would put, yeah, I would probably put Alave in the Bateman and Moore okay. tier for yeah, sure. I, can even see I could that. move Bateman. I mean, I could move Alave maybe even ahead of Bateman or like ahead of Moore at least. As for like all of London, Wilson, and Williams ahead of that group, I think I can get behind that. And I think everyone will say, the 2021 class, the top three, are better than what the receivers are here. I mean, I, I don't think that's going to be a unique take in this draft discussion. Dennis Allen's boobs on Apple Podcasts said... I saw, uh, did, I say, I, did I tell you I saw him in person? I, I met him. Were they the, looking good? No, yeah, it was pretty perfect. <laughs> hand, you know those TikToks? Like, hand up if you're a boobs guy. Hand up and Dennis Allen's just like... <laughs> when you're on the road around a lot of guys for a whole week like I was then, you know. You know. Stop. No, Stop. <laughs> Dennis Allen's boobs on Apple Podcast said, most important combine event for each position. Ooh, we've actually done some data around this. Go ahead. Okay. Quarterback, 
There's not hand. a hand. Hand size. Hand size. Period. Sure. No, hand there's, measurement. there's not there's not an important event in the combine. Forty and what do you mean? There's an important but the forty, if you're like a mobile quarterback, people look for that shit. Jalen Hurts there, running you, there should be no there's no event that actually should matter. Um okay. for running back, I think it's the broad jump. Explosiveness out of standstill is the broad jump and very important for a running back. Uh wide receiver three cone. That's running routes. That's you know cutting. That's a dig route. That's a good, that's a, <laughs> that's a five yard out. Honestly, like is what it is. And then and then like another whip route and then another out. So that's very important. Out whip uh, out. Yeah, that's out whip out. Change the name of the drill. Tight game. end. I mean, like I could see three come for tight end as well, but also like forty is important because I can also see broad. You need speed at tight. Like to like a lot of tight end routes are over routes, drag routes, flat routes where. You run those routes better if you're faster. And if you're not fast, you can't, there's no like, there's no technique to them. It's a pure how athletic you are route. So 40, very important for tight end. Offensive line, broad jump. Another one we're like, broad jump is how much force you can put from a standstill into the guy across from you. That is offensive line play, run blocking, broad jump. And now all these are like weight adjusted is like the thing to remember like, so. But that, these are the most important drills that I'm saying here, with a weight adjustment. Edge rusher, three cone, that's bending the edge. Defense tackle, I think it's 10 split. Not necessarily broad jump, but like how can you get out of a stance up the field as quickly as possible. So 10 split for a DT, very important. Linebacker, 40, probably like you just can't get by a slow linebacker, say it's NFL. Cornerback, I'd say 40 as well. Safety's tough. 40 broad i think both are important but like there's no one is the other thing to remember it's all a piece of the puzzle and it's all like player specific and person specific and yeah. the type of player they are for their respective position that's why like any like high-end research data research about you know what's the most important drill or just using these drills and just using the measurements misses a big big pieces of the puzzle there's never going to be like a one path yeah. to success one drill to success is something to remember i would argue too and i think we've had this conversation before that on average three cone and broad are more important than the 40 yard dash despite yeah. the broad the, the 40 getting all the publicity at the combine right yeah. like they you watch every single player's 40 yard dash at the combine the broad jump and the three cone are like brought up as afterthoughts i think the last combine two combines ago when they had it they didn't even show anyone's three cone. Like they just like posted the times. Like that, yeah. in my opinion, is ridiculous. Like the three cone for a lot of these high performing positions, Respect like you need cone. to see. Respect the cone. Respect the out whip out. Thanks, Dennis Allen's boobs. On to JDG983 on Apple Podcasts. Is Braden Smith transitioning from guard to tackle an anomaly, or can you use him as a possible learning tool? Can scouts take advantage of or understand guard tackle prospects who fail due to arm length? What are the tools you look for guys who might be smaller? I think it's a learning tool. I, I think it should be something that NFL offensive line coaches are far more open to in the future. And, and even go look at Joe Tooney playing left tackle in the playoffs for the Chiefs. Look better than Orlando Brown out there. And it's like, yeah, you're paying him a lot to play guard and like you're going to want to make sure he's good at whatever position he is. But I think guys like Tooney, who were college offensive tackles, who maybe didn't hit your arm length threshold, but played college offensive tackle at a very high level, it's still like a skill position, even if there is some physical tools that help your job. Maybe he's never going to be Tyron Smith, the lockdown guy at tackle, but you don't need that. And it's you can provide a, far, a lot of value by just being good there mm -hmm. that you can't provide at guard by even being a lead at guard. Yeah. Because of basically the... I, I think the issue, if, if I'm going to be honest, is yeah. that for arm length, right? You're, people are chasing eliteness at tackle. And yes, if you yes, want yes, eliteness yes. at tackle, you're going to chase 34, 35, 36 yeah. inch arms. And these guys that fit that protocol of build, yeah. I think what we need to use as a learning tool is even beyond what Braden Smith is, it's that being average at tackle is very hard to do and very good if you can get it. And if you have a guy that has 33 inch arms or 32 and a half inch arms, but can be average at tackle, maybe he'll never be Jonathan Ogden. That's valuable. It's more valuable than him being a freaking good guard, period. Yeah. It's more, val more valuable than him being even like a great guard. Yeah. If you can stick a Braden Smith or a Joe Tooney or whoever who has like 32 and a half to 33 inch arms at tackle, and they're gonna consistently be solid, 
that is objectively more valuable along the offensive line than and harder to find and because, harder to because find. teams aren't willing. No, to and that's what I'm guy. saying. It's yeah. harder to find, kind of like by their own doing, right? Yes, Somewhere. Yes, it's yes. like, like, oh no, if that guy has 33. Why do we have so few tackles? Board. This tackle moved to guard. It's exactly. Like, no, no, it's 100. percent Who's the? It. It's the. Uh, Tim Robinson meme of we all trying to find the guy who did it. Yeah, this. who's doing this? Why is there no good tackles in the NFL? Everyone's moving like guys who have like barely you know, yeah. under 33-inch arms or just above 33-inch arms. Like, oh, guard, 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 have to do it. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree with you. Um, on to Threlly on Apple Podcasts. Do you think the new GM of the Giants will keep Daniel Jones for the future if he plays better when they when they actually have a good OC? Do they actually have a good OC would probably be my follow-up to this. Also, what do you think of the you Michigan QBs? Mike huh? You don't think Mike Kafka is good? Oh, I, I think I was thinking of Jim Bob Cooter. Oh. I don't know why I think Cooter was back in the Giants, but yeah. never mind. Also, what do you think of the Mission QBs as NFL QBs? Um, the Mission QBs now? No, I think he means like Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy. Oh, yeah, okay. They're not good. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I think. You can't just say that about J.J. McCarthy. I, That's who they think is the future. Okay, well... Then go back and watch the tape. Go back and watch year. the tape, dude. Go back and watch. The I thought tape. you meant like maybe like Michigan QBs. That's like I'm yeah. That, he was asking how good do you think Tom Brady is? Brady's fine. I, I wrote here I like Brady. <laughs> That's great. It's great. <laughs> but so the Giants, I, I've said once they made that move that they're going to try to get a quarterback because <laughs> these guys aren't these guys aren't pot committed to a Daniel Jones. Yeah. You had, and that's why shit. That's why I think they got rid of like the staffs in place because they want to do better than Daniel Jones. Yeah. You know, like they want to. Because if, if they just left in Dave Gettleman as GM, he was going to ride it all back. Mm -hmm. Like He was going to let Daniel Jones to the bitter end try to fail. And it's not that Daniel Jones can't become good. It's that it's the same thing we were saying with Sam Darnold. It's that he's so far away from becoming good, becoming a guy that gets you to a Super Bowl conversation, that why, why continue down that path? Why, or why make that your only... Like, obviously, keep him on the roster. Mm -hmm. You've... There's no, there's very little downside to keeping him on the roster, but do whatever you can to also upgrade at that position because, like I said, you're not tied to him. Are you so arguing I, I that they, go, they should take they go one elsewhere. at five or seven? No, I, I mean, I wouldn't take one at five or seven, but I would explore avenues to getting one, and that might even mean second round. Yeah, to top of the second round. That's yeah. where my head went, like maybe grabbing a Carson Strong or yeah. you know, Des Desmond Ritter falls to the second. That would be a dream scenario for Brian Dable and this Giants. That is a fit I love. Yeah. Desmond Ritter falls to second, and the Giants are able to grab him at the top of day two. That would be phenomenal. Even if Daniel Jones improves, you have this other, like you have multiple avenues to getting eliteness or greatness at the quarterback position. Yeah. All right, this is from Ethanwa on Apple Podcasts. I love the pod, boys. My question is for Mike. I'm a business major like you. I mentioned working in a similar field as you. I was wondering how you exactly got your job at PFF and how you worked your way through the company to your position you have now. Do you have any tips for someone who's trying to work in football? Don't tell them exactly how you got it. I feel like that story's a little R, but tell me how you got R? there. No, I'm just kidding. I was just making it. It was joke. just, I, I just applied. That was back in 2012 when PFF had nobody. This I was, guy's I was asking one for the, feedback on how to get a job and you're like, just apply? I was one of the first 10 employees at PFF. And I also cheated on my uh, test to get- uh, Apply and um, cheat. Yeah, that that's what I did. <laughs> so, so to, it was applying for, it was just called analyst position. It was basically just data collection. And it was player participation, which is where everyone lined up on the football field. And after my first trial, I did well enough to get like a second uh, trial run, but they also gave me a PFF subscription after my first trial. Oh, and nice. so I could go in and I found where to find where their data said everyone lined up on the field <laughs> at this time. And so I just copied it uh, for my second one. And that's how I ended up scoring. <laughs> I ended up having like one of the three highest uh, accuracy rates of anyone how? in it. I don't know. I was just very good at it, apparently. And PFF underscore Mike's a fraud. And that's how I got the job initially. I'm gonna uh, give. Can I give him some actual feedback? Sure. I would. I would take what Renner said, bottle yeah. it up, and turn it into PFF offers part-time positions. Yes. Data collection positions that anyone can apply to. Anyone can go through these trials for. There's three sets of trials to show that you can do base level data collection at PFF. If you put the effort in or cheat one or the other, you'll probably get through the trials and you'll be a part-time analyst at PFF. Then from there, it's providing value within PFF, continuing to learn new things, getting into soccer, because PFF's getting into soccer, and working your way up into the role. Now, it's gonna be a lot harder. It's easier to work your way up in a company when there's 10 people than when there's like 100. So like Mike's, yes. Mike's journey was a lot, there was, it's an abridged it version of, anymore, yeah, it doesn't yeah. exist at PFF anymore. Even my journey, when I first got on yeah. consumer, there was like 20, 19 people yeah. full-time, and there was more opportunities to move up. Now there's like, 
a hundred. I do love how you said uh, you look like a guy that cuts corners. I'm like, I literally got you. Yeah. Literally cut corners. You yeah. literally, <laughs> you yeah. literally cut corners to get the job. All right. I also say to give more advice about like how I moved up at PFF. Like I'm passionate about what I do. Like when, like yeah, sure, I cut corners, but like when I have to do something, I will l- l- stay up and do whatever it takes to get my job done love when that, that is the love case. That. So love that. this is from Dmax17 on Apple Podcast. How is Ahmad Gardner not caps not? the greatest court college football quarterback of all time. Has there ever been another quarterback who's played over a thousand snaps in coverage and never given up a TD or allowed a pass rating greater than the equivalent of spiking the ball into the ground instead of targeting him? Oh, and he did it before turning 22? D-Max all over you right now. Why isn't Ahmad Gardner the best college football quarterback we've ever seen? I feel like not to belittle his last point there, but like anyone who plays three years of college is doing it. Doing it under 22, 22 yeah. So that, that last point, but... He's the greatest statistically that we've seen. And the thing is, like, I don't, no one collected stats on cornerbacks yeah, before exactly. we did, you know? Like, so I don't know. Prior to that, I'm sure there were some lockdown dudes back in the day. Like, Deion I'm sure Sanders Deion Sanders prior, yeah. was probably pretty sick uh, coming Gave out. 80 I'm sure Charles Woodson didn't probably allow a lot of catches to win the Heisman, you know? But statistically, since we've started tracking, yes, he is. So. Fair. This is from Tommy Ohanan on Spotify. Mike said the Jags shouldn't take Neal because they have two top 50 picks at offensive tackle already. Don't they already have two top, top 50 picks at edge and chase on an Allen when the right move would be drafting a blindside protector for the franchise QB? I think the thing you're forgetting is that chase on stinks out loud. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't been question. good. Yeah. Um, I think so then the other thing is you can get all three of those guys in the field at the same time, whether it's um, just in sub packages where all three can rush the passer at once. Chase or on getting the boys whether it's just in Where there's just in like breathers, like a three-man rotation on the edge. So all three of those feel at the same time. I guess you could move Juwan Taylor inside to guard. I, I don't think Walker Little's a guard. He is firmly a tackle. So if you want to walk a little and Evan Neal as your tackles, you probably could move Juwan Taylor inside to guard. But the other thing is like, I just feel better by Hutchinson as a prospect too. So. This is from Jameson Schumacher on Apple Podcast. What is your dream job? What are some factors general public doesn't understand about being a GM and why there hasn't been a lot of good ones? What do you think of Atomic Habits? Okay. One, dream job, living the dream right now. Roommates with my, my best podcast co-host and we're fucking hmm. directing some fire-ass content. Factors Wish in the GM the public that. don't really understand. I got, I'm going to get on my soapbox here. Hmm. This is what people don't understand about GMs. They're... Number one goal, not every single time, is to win. Their number one goal is to make money, period. It, and that sometimes is paying Christian McCaffrey on a second contract. That's sometimes drafting a running back higher than many people expect. It is sometimes making decisions that don't clear the shortest path to winning a Super Bowl. And that I feel like people don't understand sometimes. I think GMs are obviously looking to keep their jobs and all that stuff. And like some of that too is the longevity aspect, right? Sometimes you're making decisions to get another year, to get another two years being a GM in the NFL. It's not as simple as like, why isn't he just trying to win a Super Bowl? Because you look at some of the moves that, you know, some of these GMs make and you're like, I, with all the data that's available, how are you making this decision? I'll tell you what, if an owner calls you up, say I'm GM Jerry, GM Jerry, and the owner calls me who pays my checks and says, I really like Saquon Barkley. You think I'm not going to make Saquon Barkley? I'm like, no, yeah, I'll take Saquon Barkley if that means I can stay another year. Steve Keim has been with the Arizona Cardinals since like 2001. You're telling me it's because he's making his calls and his calls only? No, it's called the owner is calling him up and saying, I want this and I want that. And Steve Keim's like, he absolutely, doesn't. absolutely. That's what people don't understand about GMs. GMs are not out here trying to win Super Bowls. They're trying to make the owners happy. And sometimes that's making decisions that don't help you make Super Bowls. Well, see, that's why I feel like I'd be a good GM because I really don't care when like people tell me like, oh yeah, you'd as, be a obviously. really good GM. I'm just saying, like, you wouldn't I, last I would not a succumb. To, year. I would not succumb to the pressure. You know this for, for yeah. a fact. No, I do I that. <laughs> that if I was told to do something, I would not just do it just because I was told to do something. But I do think that's the other, that's the biggest thing I've learned kind of like seeing somewhat behind the scenes in this job is that GMs don't get to just make decisions with autonomy. Exactly. It's not just, I get to build whatever I think is the best roster. There are serious external pressures, whether it's from your head coach, whether it's from your owner mainly is probably the biggest one that you hear where it's like, they don't get to just make decisions of what they think is best. They are told at times or made to do exactly. things at times that are not what they think is the best. The hardest best. thing about being a GM in the NFL is not player evaluation, it's not contract evaluation, it is balancing the expectations of ownership while also trying to prioritize winning a fucking Super Bowl. 
that is difficult to do. When you got guys in your ear saying, we need to do this, we need to do yeah. that, because the money's coming in this way. People are buying season tickets because of McCaffrey and Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas. you got to make some decisions here. And you're like, wait a second. I don't know if I want to do this. Michael Thomas hasn't showed up to rehab. I don't know if I want to make these calls. You know, like, But you end up getting pushed one way or the other. Last part of this was, what did you think of Atomic Habits? We listened to that in an audio book yeah. on the tailgate tour. I thought it was phenomenal. It's a great book. Yeah, I, I really liked it in terms of like have building strategies and all that. I, I'm a very big fan of behavioral science books and like psychology of decision making in general so I, I would recommend if you like atomic habits or are interested in that as well i've read thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman it's very good how children succeed by shit i should know who that's by is a very good book uh four thousand weeks is a very good book and also range is a very good book I like on range. topics like that about basically like decision making how, how thought processes work and how to like improve your just overall outlook on life sweet uh todd on twitter would you love would you love oh no sorry would you guys consider going to tallahassee to tailgate at fsu next year if the Knolls are having a stellar season yes i'll consider it yes i'm officially considering it we have mapped out to a degree we have five games planned tentatively I, but the thing is like this so is the problem with this is we don't want to like we want to plan out early in advance so that like to, so people can plan ahead themselves. But we also don't want to go to a game late in the season that, that stinks. So we did that a handful of times last year. Yes. So we're like when we went to LSU, Florida, there just weren't people tailgating because both teams stunk. Or even time. Kentucky LSU, like was yes. kind of a drag. So, I, so to we're looking back, to go somewhere yeah. like so if Florida State, we need like a little confirmation that this is gonna be a squad next year. We're looking at the Clemson or the Florida game as being like options for them. But if they're gonna stink and there's not gonna be fans, well shit. To peel back so, the curtain a little bit on the 2022 tailgate tour, we are going to probably go to four to six games this year. Yeah. How we actually debut those games will be difficult. I think we need to submit like a bracket or a voting mechanism on what we should do. Yeah. But I think we're going to end up aligning on four to six games probably over the summer. Yo, it's Alibu on Apple Podcasts. Should the Ravens take offensive line if David Ojabo is there? That's a tough. It depends on the offensive line. If you got one of the three top tackles in this class, steering you in the face, Evan Neal, Aki Kwanu, or Charles Cross, take one of those guys if you're the Ravens, for mm -hmm. sure. I don't think one of those three will, will be staring them in the face. So then at that point, Ryman or Penning versus uh, the one guy I could see being a fit there more so than anywhere else, Trevor Penning, that they could be high on. Nor do I well off his tackle because he is a run blocking. I don't want to say sure thing, but that dude cuts teeth as a run blocker. And that's like what the Ravens do offensively. They don't need the pass protectors with Lamar Jackson back there. Mm -hmm. So that's the one guy I could see considering over Ojabo, but they're so good at developing edge rushers and Ojabo has what they could want. Him in no way, if they hit, that's a scary tandem. What's your best out there take? Mine was calling Nathaniel Hackett as a head coach back in 2018. This is from Bitey Mike on Apple Podcasts. <sighs> that's a tough... I don't know. I haven't had uh, like out there takes. I don't know. It's my best like draft take I've ever had in terms of like that was out there from the consensus that has been proven correct. Like his hack a take was I called Chris Jones the top three guy in 2016. Wow. That was he goes to the second round. That one looks good in retrospect. But I don't try to think of like out there ones that really I was when I was first I was writing for my own website. Okay. The draft .com, I did say I liked Khalil Mack over Jadavion Clowney, which I think was at not was against some of the consensus back then. Now, I didn't know what I was talking about, and that was probably just by <laughs> luck that I ended up saying that, watching like YouTube highlights of both those players. But uh, I was not big on Clowney. I, I, but again, that was like I was also like 16, so I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't great. Um, this is from 33i on Apple Podcasts. Who's best for the Colts? Marcus Mariota or Jimmy Garoppolo? Yikes. That's mm. a tough mailbag i feel for colts fans if that's the type of shit you're asking yourself i think mariota purely because you could amplify the run game like mm -hmm. you could do things with him in the run game that make jonathan taylor's life easier and shit like they like that's how they won that's how they yeah, won yeah. games this past year and if you make that a dominant i want to see mariota start in the nfl attack. again and i think colts is a good is yeah. a good place for him so i, I lean mariota i agree this is from bruce leroy nc on apple podcasts 
What if the NFL adopted the NCAA model of positional awards? How would you award them and name them? Wow. Okay. Okay. So best overall player usually leans an offensive guy. That's like what the Maxwell or the Heisman. Call it the Barry Sanders. Just because you me, saw him? Uh, no, this is before I even saw him, which is wild. Um, I, it, uh, to me, Barry Sanders is the best player I've ever seen on a football field. Just in terms of like, he moved so differently and was so insane of what he could do that I think Barry Sanders deserves it. And this year, I think Cooper Cup would be the guy who gets it. Yeah. I think he's the favorite to win offense player of the year. Yeah. That's basically like an offense player of the year. Quarterback. Johnny Unitas, I don't know, it's always named after weird old guys. Maybe Dan Marino, you could get it too, because like pure quarterback, Dan Marino was like a... That, this year I would give it to Aaron Rodgers. Running back, you caught the, you know, it's always named after like old guys who are very good. So you give it to O.J. Simpson. You're not giving running back to O.J. Simpson. <laughs> you don't want the O.J. Simpson? You'd be like the Herschel Walker or something. Or like, who's the Browns guy? I'm a piece of shit for not Jim Brown. Jim Brown, the Jim Brown. <laughs> Jim Brown. I think Jim Brown would probably be who right, you Jim actually Brown. give it okay. to. Or AP John if you want to go a little more recent. AP was lit. AP was. AP's also in the house. Jonathan Taylor will be giving it to this year. Wide receiver Jerry Rice. Duh. Duh. Cooper Cup. Duh. Tight ends. Kellen Winslow. No. I don't know. Uh, no. We go Anthony or Tony Gonzalez. Yeah. Go, Tony or, Gonzalez. Or Antonio Morrison. Gates. No. Gates Tony was Gonzalez sick. was better than. <gasps> Say that out loud. Tony Gonzalez better than Tony Gates. No, he was not. I Antonio mean, Gates statistically was better. far better. I need up. to look it up. Mark Andrews this year gets it for the tight end. Offensive line. This one I probably need. We had where Jeff Schwartz was over here earlier, former mm -hmm. offside line for the Chiefs. Probably need his take on this, but I want Larry Allen. No, Larry, Larry Allen's, Allen's definitely like, no, I like that. the most fun to watch at least. Mm. Hashtag off slime him. And Trent Williams gets it this year. D line, Reggie White. Gotta name it after him. Yeah. Well, a lot of Packers guys here. Uh Aaron Donald gets it this year for that. Mm -hmm. Linebacker would call it the Dick Buckus. I, even though I've probably never seen a down of Dick Buckus play, he's just he's not yeah <laughs> dope ass name, and it's already called the Buckus at the college level anyway. So Fred Warner gets it this year. DB Night Train Lane, I don't know Deion Sanders, one of those. I like Night Train Lane though. Sick I like Deion. Yeah, like Night Train Lane's a good name. I think Deion Sanders is where I'd lean. Yeah, Jalen Ramsey gets it this year. And then overall defender, the Lawrence Taylor LT, goes to Aaron Donald. Yeah, there you go. All right, I, I I'm proven wrong. What was it? Receiving yards per game. Tony Gonzalez, 56. Antonio Gates, 50.2. Receptions per game, 4.9 for Tony Gonzalez, 4.0 for Antonio Gates. Touchdowns, though, in fewer games, much fewer games, Gates beats him out, mm. 116 to 111. And yards per reception, Gates beats him out, 12.4 to 11.4. But it's tight. It's tight. I Tell think you're right, Antonio though. Gates. I think Tony Gonzalez is the better pick. I, I just remember Antonio Gates like bending over the Raiders yeah. when, I was a, when I was in my prime fandom. Gonzalez did too. They were in the same division. They obviously, they both had their way. Ladane yeah. and Tomlinson, though, stole a lot of Gates' thunder. Ladane and Tomlinson True. had like six TDs a game. All right. This is from Joe B. 1479. Two more, and then we'll drop off. Favorite stadium atmosphere. How do you avoid helmet scouting and leave personal bias aside? This, yeah, the first answer is obvious. The wideout at Penn State wideout is Penn probably State. one of the best games I'll ever go to from an atmosphere perspective. How do you avoid same helmet scouting? That's tough. And I think the biggest thing is to be cognizant of it. And to like, so to go back to what I said about that book, Thinking Fast and Slow, a lot of bias is one, subconscious, and two, two like surface level reactions is a lot of bias. Like once you start to think, you can overcome bias by like thinking through a problem or thinking through when you're watching a guy's tape, like what you're actually seeing and processing and not just like a lot of people go through life and just like are reacting and not necessarily is the whole point of the thing fast and slow book, not like actually delving into why they're thinking the thoughts that just come into their mind immediately. So, wow. Yeah. Deep. So that's, I think that's the biggest thing to do is to be intentional about what you're watching and who this guy is and not to just be reacting to what you're seeing. I think a lot of that too. And you hinted at it with the deep philosophical question answer. But just like being aware of your biases and like yeah. entering those things with awareness of your biases. All right. This is from Mad Maddie 202 Last one. Then we'll jump to the Marshall Falk interview, the much anticipated San Diego State legend and Marshall Falk talk one on one. Mad Maddie 202 Should Ravens trade up to get Kyle Hamilton or Derek Stingley? If they fall to 10 to 12, what offensive line fits them the best? If they fall that far, yes. Because you could probably trade up for yeah. a fourth. That's the thing. It's like at that point, we don't advocate trading up, but. There still has to be an evaluation aspect to it that a guy is that good. And again, like you said, won't cost that much to go get. I would do it. O-line fits him best. Like I said, one of the top three, like there's that clear tier, but like outside of that top three, Trevor Penning is a dude that I would want on that offensive line. 
before we jump to the Marshall Falk interview, remember that this podcast is sponsored by Manscaped. Roses are red, violets are blue. Don't let a wild pube wreck you. Valentine's Day is just around the corner, and our sponsors at Manscaped are here for you with the best tools to get your balls ready for the special occasion. This V-Day, it's time to join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, the leaders in below-the-way screaming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code PFF for 20% off and free shipping. The holidays went by so quickly, Mike, I didn't even remember to take care of my package with the best tools for the job. And now I have the Performance Package 4.0 for Manscaped, and it's the best thing every guy needs in their life, including myself, to make each and every day a little more special. I'd like to propose making February 13th a national holiday is National Shave Your Balls Day. Now, so they say that, right? I'm more of a day of, night of shave type. You know, you go day before, there's some growth opportunity in between. No, you want the day before. You want the day before? Yeah. Okay. Or else it turns into like needles. Oh. You know Who's with me? I think this one's all day for men and women. Get behind. Manscaped created their products for a night just like this and will make your V-Day date say what? Nice balls. No, it's wow. Great set of balls you have oh, great there. Set of balls you're there. close. There you go. Get 20% off plus free shipping with code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. And use code PFF. Join Cupid and shoot your arrow with Manscaped this Valentine's Day. Now on to San Diego State Legends. A couple of bros ripping it up. Marshall Falk and myself here. Super Bowl 56. Now joining the Tailgate Podcast is former San Diego State legend. I went to San Diego State as well, graduated in 2017. I feel like everyone, oh, nice, yeah, nice. everyone, uh, when I was there, man, your pictures are everywhere. All the greats go to San Diego State, All the greats, all the greats. Kirk Morrison, Marshall Falk, Austin Gale, obviously going to San Diego State. That was uh, awesome to see. I saw some of the vintage jerseys that you had at San Diego State. I think that was peak San Diego State jerseys. I got to mm-hmm. be honest. The, the retro red and black were the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love them. <laughs> Well, obviously here for Super Bowl Sunday, your Los Angeles Rams here in the Super Bowl. I want to start with this backfield, right? And I, you maybe don't have the same experience with Cam Akers and the injury that he's had, but like I guess speak to how insane it is that he is coming back from this Achilles injury. His Super Bowl prop is at like 64 yards. The fact that he's come back in the same season and is able to have the success that he's had in the postseason, I think is crazy. I mean, I can't believe what he's doing right now. Yeah, I was, uh, I was amazed that he was able to just, you know, the speed of the game a lot of the times for running backs when we sit out. And uh, and I and I and I like how they worked him back in. They sparingly put him in and and, and kind of got his feet wet. Mm-hmm. And then in the in the in the Tampa game, he really took off. And mm-hmm. obviously, he had a couple of fumbles, but I think he knocked the rust off. And uh, I saw him protecting the ball and being a little bit more cautious of it against the 49ers. But he adds a, a different dynamic. Um, that second level explosion. Um, he's a home run hitter. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to take anything away from Henderson and 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 and, and Sony Michelle, but. But he's a he's a different kind of back. Staying with the Los Angeles Rams, I guess, how surprised were you at how quickly Matthew Stafford was able to come to Los Angeles and have the success that he had, right? Coming over from Detroit, I think people had a lot of high expectations, but he's met those, right? He's met those in Los Angeles. They brought him in over here to get to a Super Bowl. Were you at all shocked at just how quickly he's been able to hit the ground running? Well, um, you know, Sean McVay is a he, he, everything he does is quarterback friendly. Mm-hmm. He provides the quarterback the tools and the things that's that's needed to be successful, and um, all that I've heard about Matthew Stafford was he he was a high IQ kind of guy. Yeah, and um, it, it, it's you know the arm talent is there. We knew that, and uh, I just want to correct you. They brought him in here to win a Super Bowl. Fair. <laughs> Jerry Goff got them to a Super Bowl, so they brought him in to win the Super Fair. Bowl, and that's what he has to do. No, and I think, I mean, obviously favored by four and a half in this game. They mm-hmm. are the... Is it four and a half now? Yeah, it's, it's four, four and a half. It's oh, four and a half. That, 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 tri- that tricky half point, man. <laughs> that tricky... That, Where are you leaning? Are you leaning the four and a half? Are you going to oh, take the Rams you know in the what? point? I was, I was good on the four with the Rams, but that half point, man, it's like... I don't know. <laughs> the hook is always scary. <laughs> that little half point. Oh, man. I see it 24-20, like right now. That half a point, it gets you every time. It will, it will. It probably will get you. But staying with Los Angeles Rams, too, I know you've talked a little bit about Odell Beckham Jr. and how much he's had success. I saw you on the Pat McAfee show, some Browns fans upset. But the other receiver in this game, Cooper Cup, Triple Crown winner. A guy I was talking to, uh, Brandon Marshall, here yesterday, and he's like, I don't think the league has ever seen a Cooper Cup. What have been your impressions of his impact on this Rams team? I mean, we've, we've, we've seen it. I mean, it, and it's, it, you know, that we, we've had some receivers do amazing things. And I think as the game continues to, you know, with the rules, kind of changing we're going to see receivers surpass what Cooper Cup did Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just impressed with his durability his availability and the fact that they know he's going to get the ball 
they double him and he still, <laughs> he, he still gets open not just like he's catching the ball up he gets open and they know he's going to get the ball but um as 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 great as he has been i think the supporting cast is what what we we have to really pay attention to mm-hmm. because let's say if, if Van Jefferson don't step up, if OBJ don't make some of the big catches that he made. If if let's say when it's Higby and then Blanton stepping in, yeah. the other pieces they've really shown up in a big way. The other receiver getting all the targets, getting double coverage in this game is Jamar Chase, the rookie phenom that yeah. broke the receiving yards record that his former teammate broke in the year prior. Jamar Chase, one of the special talents in the NFL, probably already solidifying himself as a top five, top 10 receiver in the NFL. Do you expect Jalen Ramsey to slow him down, a guy that's only allowed 100 yards in a single game once this season? I, I believe that what, what what they're going to do is is, is what they've done with a lot of great receivers that they've played against is there's going to be times where Jalen plays them one-on-one and they're going to scheme Mm -hmm. and do some different things and uh, give him a bunch of different looks. I've I've seen Raheem Morris do a great job at confusing quarterbacks and receiver tandems. um, And and, and, and I I like the matchup, but this isn't the time you, you create and try to play win one-on-one battles with yeah. Ramsey and, and and Chase. This is this is about winning the game by any means necessary. It's a big reason why, honestly, I like the T. Higgins overs in this game. I like the Tyler Boyd overs in this game because Jalen Ramsey and Jamar Chase are going to get all the attention, but the middle of the field will be open, and I think that's where T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd ultimately cook. I was talking to Lincoln Riley, who had opportunities to coach Samaj P. Ryan and Joe Mixon, the two backs for the Bengals. Your opinion of this backfield, he has high hopes for them. I think Mixon's total is at 70, 72 and a half. Samaj P. Ryan somewhere in the five and a half range but this backfield those two Oklahoma backs your thoughts yeah I, I, I think for for uh, for Mixon um, you know th- those numbers are fairly low <laughs> and, and when you think about the Rams they, they play the bend and don't break they'll give up some run plays yeah. they're they're not they're not the stoutest against the run and sometimes in the rushing the passer mode they they, they run by some running backs mm-hmm. with the football in their hand so I look I look I look for Mixon and, and, and Piran, especially in the passing game for Piran, because they use them a lot in the passing game. But Joe Mixon, big physical back. Um, it's 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 just weird that we're talking about running backs mm-hmm. in the NFL. They they don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, they don't. They really only don't. in the playoffs. Only in the playoffs. Only in the Super Bowl. <laughs> right? No, it's true. No, it's true. Um, I guess you kind of hinted at your final score prediction for this game. You're in that 24-21 range. Do you think he gets over the four and a half? Where you're at for final score? You know. Um, Man, you know, I think it. I, I, I think it. I think it does. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, uh, let's go, 24:30. Mm-hmm. I see that. Last thing for you, I know you're doing a lot of work with Maxim Bet, and they're, you know, preaching that take breaks, set budgets for your betting, all that stuff. I guess speaks to the work you're doing with them. Yeah, it's all about being responsible, and that's that's what we're doing. Obviously, there's a lot of different places to go. We encourage you to come and uh, and 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 place your bets with Maxim Bet. Um, uh, great history with the magazine, mm-hmm. deciding to give their subscri- subscribers a, a, a safe place to bet because everybody's in the gambling world these days. But I think the most important thing is understanding your limitations and knowing like, hey, um, if you only have $1,000 to your name, you probably shouldn't be betting $1,000 <laughs> on this true. game. That's <laughs> true. No, I agree. Well, I really appreciate the time and go Aztecs. All you. good, man. Appreciate right it. on. Go. Jam-packed week, dude. We finally get back in Cincinnati. We're going to unload the apartment. Maybe we get some content out there on TikTok, get the people behind mm. the scenes. You know, you ever watch those TikToks that are like, they go through their like day, wake up at 4.30, get some emails going. Yeah, it's yeah. the most creative part of my life. Make a bowl of oatmeal, eat sick. it, cry, call my mom, finally get to work at 7 a.m. I think we need to start doing yours this from would the be, I want to see what yours would be like. They're not good. Yeah. They're not good. <laughs> Kill myself. No. All right. <laughs> uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Tailgate. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast next week. Probably going to do four episodes next week. Get a bonus mailbag out, get some speak pipes out. But until next time, back in Cincinnati, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, Tailgate.